Thank you very much for coming to this presentation. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a subject that I've been working on for quite some time. And some of my thoughts have been crystallized since 2016, a bit better when I taught a course at uh, Stanford on the power pressure prediction. And since then, I have taken some of those ideas and put it together into a, putting together into a book on geo pressure that is going to come out at the end of this year. And Tapan is a co-author of that book, along with the other co-author, Rand Bakarab at Slumberjay. So I want to begin with by thanking Tanvi, Anatoly, and uh, Anshuman for walking me through the maze of Zoom. And I thought I was Zoomed, floored, but I managed to get up. And here we are today, it's working. So thank you for, for helping me, guys and ladies. So this presentation benefited greatly from contributions from Wissam, Anshuman, and Hui. These are the students uh, at, the, at Stanford, Geophysics and Geology, and the SCARF, and I greatly acknowledge their help. <clears throat> the premise of this talk is essentially going to be towards proposing a integrated workflow in which I try to integrate strengths of seismic imaging and the pore pressure and basin modeling concepts together using pore pressure as a platform. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask myself that if all these approaches give me a consistent and physical pore pressure, will my earth modeling, or and I will define what I mean by earth modeling, will my velocity modeling for uh, seismic will be improved. That's the, that's the premise. The second slide is a brief outline of the talk. Uh, I will, in one slide, I will try to review the existing linear workflows and the deficiencies. And I will define in that next slide what the linear workflow is. Then I will introduce this so-called integrated workflow and then I will uh, elaborate uh, the workflow with some examples, some simple examples, and make some uh, general comments at the end. So this is a key slide, uh, beginning slide. This tells us about how we currently make pore pressure prediction, which is leveled at the upper left as PPP, that stands, stands for pore pressure prediction. There are three ways that I have identified the, the pore pressure prediction system and how it works. On the left, we have basin history simulation model in which we start with this lots of parameters that you, you know well, I don't need to go through that. And this basin history will give you a pore pressure model at today's time. So all geological transients are captured in that approach. On the right hand side, I have got a seismic approach in which we begin with the seismic wiggles that is translated or transferred into a velocity model through a seismic inversion and that is migrated and get into at the imaging technology. And that will give you not only an image, but also a, a pore pressure that is coming from the velocity model that is behind the image. And the third approach is this rock physics approach in which uh, the literature is very full. Lots of models are available. Many of the parameters are micro parameters that I will not go through it, but they all give you a estimate of pore pressure prediction model. So now we have a linear workflow from the basin history, a linear workflow from the seismic, and we got a linear workflow from the rock physics toolkit. So we got three types of pore pressure, at least the one that I have been able to identify. And the question is, uh, have we done the best? Is it the best we can do? What are the errors and the uncertainties? How does a improvement in one, for example, seismic model can impact the basin model? These questions are not answered. There are other things that we need to answer, for example, the strengths of basin model is the 
that we have captured all geologic transients, but it is essentially a low resolution model of pore pressure. On the other hand, on the, on the right, I have seismic approach. Seismic approach gives me pore pressure only today's geologic time. We don't capture what happened 30, 40, 50 million years ago. But it is a high resolution model because it has a lot more details, as you can see from the little cartoon seismic that I have in the diagram. But the disadvantage of that model is that, uh, of this approach, is that quite often we get non-physical pore pressure. By non-physical, I mean pore pressure that is uh, below hydrostatic pore pressure or higher than the fracture pressure, for example. So this is, I call a non-physical. So these are the strengths and weaknesses, and we want to construct a model in which we build on these strengths, and hopefully weaknesses can be minimized, though not completely eliminated. And I will talk about that when I give you some examples. In the next slide, I elaborate a bit more on the negative consequences of these linear workflows. I said already a few things. For example, there is no feedback loop in the process. Uh, for example, seismic velocity and basin model. We have got a linear workflow and basin model starting with some seismic. And then we got a seismic velocity using some very high powered, very good quality velocity work. But that does not quite feed into the basin model directly. So the improvement in one process does not directly impact the other. So we need a workflow in which that can be handled. The good images may not lead to better pore pressure. That is a, uh, one consequence, negative consequence of linear workflow. And I said that the pore pressure can be non-physical, below hydrostatic, for example. In the seismic, velocities are often too fast. And fast velocities are good for stacking sometimes. The stacks look good, but in the, in the process, you degrade the quality of the, of the uh, pre pore pressure. And the pore pressure can be uh, below hydrostatic. And that creates large uncertainties in the exploration targets, seal definition, drilling parameters, casing points, and so on. Second issue that we have to deal with uh, in this linear workflow, seismic images and pore pressure are usual in the seismic depth. If you are using seismic approach, the basin modeling uses a depth that is coming from the, from the seismic. Uh, it is hardware there. However, it may not reflect the true depth, uh, which will impact the basin model. And the true depth is re usually in the drilling community, it comes from counting the number of stand-up pipes that you have used as a fixed uh, uh, length of, of length. That is usually the, the, the gold standard in the drilling community. That's called the true depth. Uh, many rock physics models require parameters that cannot be measured. For example, if you build a model and if you like it and use it, and I have done that many, many times, use models, things like at poor aspect ratio parameter, gain, grain to grain contact, things of that kind, which are nice to have a model build on, but which are very difficult to quantify. It ends up being an adjustable parameter. And there are many such parameters are there in rock physics. And the last approach, last, last item is in, in this bullet is that uh, since we are getting these models, th at least three different models to give me uh, three different answers for pore pressure that drillers can use, but it's a dilemma, drillers dilemma and explorers dilemma is which one to rely on. Some models may not apply even for well placement and some models may not give you uh, inversion attributes for lithology and so on and so forth. So these are some of these uh, negative consequences. There may be some more, you may be able to think some more. So we look at, we need to look at this issue a little more. Uh, and the goal here that we set up is to build a geophysical velocity model. Since I'm a seismic guy, I emphasize that. So build a geophysical velocity model that yields a realistic pore pressure. Realistic means that nothing should be in the unphysical range. And also 
at the same time that I uh, get the realistic pore pressure, I want to get the realistic image using the same velocity model so that I don't have to alternate between multiple migration models, multiple velocity models, and multiple pore pressure models. So that is one criteria I set it up. This really means that <clears throat> geologically, we need to create a geologically plausible model and a physically possible model. That means the models will require constraints. And I'm going to use the, the physical constraint on the spore pressure and few other things. I would also like to suggest that we can build a basin model for pore pressure that provides a feedback loop to seismic velocity modeling. Because seismic velocity modeling is basically non-unique, inherently non-unique. There are multiple choices for velocity models. They all look good just visually, but when you apply some models to predict some attribute, you get different result as compared to either a drilling data or some other uh, data that is coming from outside the domain. So uh, we need to derive a new structural and stratigraphic model based on this improved velocity model. And that ties back to the first item that I talked in the last slide, a feedback loop mechanism. So it is very simple, very high level uh, slide here. And I call it for lack of better words, integrated workflow. And this integrated workflow should build on the strengths of each components. The components are basin modeling, rock physics model, and of course, seismic velocity model. So here is a realization uh, of this workflow a uh, one level down uh, in which we begin. And this is something that came to, came to me in 2016 when I was teaching this course at Stanford. Uh, basin modeling is a very good source of beginning this integrated workflow because it, uh, it uses a whole slew of geological parameters that quite often we miss in our seismic approach. Plus, it, as I said, it also captures the, all the geologic transients and these transients like a thermal transients and so on that is created by uh, multiple sedimentation and burial. Those transients are extremely important for today's pressure. So, <coughs> excuse me. The basin modeling gives me what I call a, a approach to give me what I want, a pore pressure as a starting model. It also will give me porosity, some mineral volume fraction and effective stress. These are the important quantities to build, build the model that I'm going to suggest. This will feed into the next box, which is called the rock physics modeling box. For example, sand shale models, velocity model, and the anisotropy parameters such as epsilon and deltas. The whole idea of this toolbox here is to take the pore pressure that is coming from basin model and convert that pore pressure into velocity model. Now, why do you want to do that? The reason I want to do that is because I want to get that velocity as a starting model to get into my seismic inversion toolkit. This inversion toolkits have a multitude of algorithms, multitude of models. The ones, the two that I picked uh, are very important ones. And uh, these are very uh, common now. It's called anisotropic tomography workflow as a very viable tool for velocity model building. And of course the anisotropic uh, full waveform inversion. A lot of work is going on uh, at Stanford in uh, beyond those team. And I benefited greatly by interaction uh, with his team uh, when Hui was working with, uh, with me uh, on some of these concepts. So the whole idea of this uh, seismic inversion workflow is to obtain an improved velocity and that is starting from the basin model. And then this iteration process and there's an iteration loop in the seismic inversion, this iteration loop will give me a converged velocity model. And I call that 
this last box, the updated model, which will be an improved image, a structural model, an improved velocity model, pore pressure, an isotropy parameter, and also a new time to depth because the velocity model has been different now than what came from the basin model. It's going to the seismic inversions, so have a new time to depth. So this time to depth, new time to depth, and new structural model needs to be fed back into basin model. This is what I call a grand loop of this integration workflow. The reason I colored this one left because uh, with the red color, because nobody has done this loop yet. Okay, we are close to, and I will give you some example how close we are getting to it, uh, beginning 2016. So we are coming close to closing this loop, but it has not been done yet. Okay, the so iteration of this integrated workflow stops when velocity, pore pressure, rock model, and images share the same model. <coughs> Excuse me, I have to get a gulp of water here. Thank you. So when uh, velocity model, pore pressure, rock model, and images share the same model, I call that we are getting closer to the earth model. This is my definition of getting closer to earth model. So the value of this integration will be, and I will give you some example to elucidate further, that we, we can generate we may be able to generate reliable models for multi-purpose use. For example, imaging, I said, geological model building structure and cross sections, geomechanics, pore pressure and stresses, they will all come from the same model. This will impact you know, hydrocarbon seal capacity and seal strength analysis, hydrocarbon columnite, flow across faults for pressure compartment uh, identification. Second bullet is kind of important is that images and the pressures will be all at the same depth now. It will provide, I hope, a link, the improvements in one process to others, such as imaging and pore pressure. And in the process, maybe we have to define or maybe better define the rock model that is the, the way we connect from pore pressure to, uh, to image. And these models are closer, as I said, to the earth model, which is defined, to remind you again, this is defined to yield true physical properties of earth, such as velocity, pressure, porosity, and water content. We are not there yet, and I'm not claiming that this integration will, uh, will give us a earth model. No, but we are closer than what would be if we use the linear workflow through the velocity model or basin modeling alone. So let me give an example of an integrated workflow. And I have taken a simple model here for gravitational loading of shales and sands, tertiary clastics. As this, uh, the, uh, the loading happens, sedimentary column builds, various geological processes kick in. And the key to building a velocity model that will lead to pressure, pressure model and of course to the seismic model, will be to recognize some of these geological processes and drive the pressure model based on those processes. So what are these processes? Number one is a mechanical compaction. That is the porosity reduction and release of uh, pore water that is coming in the system. Second is the retardation of fluid flow causing overpressure. And this is due to the fact that as the porosity reduces due to compaction, permeability reduces even faster. So it is the main reason that why fluid flow is retarded chiefly. There may be other reason too. And that causes building uh, excess pore pressure. That's number two. Number three is the, the various other physical phenomena related to heating, aquathermal pressuring being one of them. Uh, that affects the pore pressure and aquathermal pressuring deals with the change in, changes in the fluid and the rock properties uh, due to heat capacity, specific uh, heat flow and so on, uh, specific flow of energy and so on. So all of these things due to heating will affect the pore pressure model. Then the fourth one that we have to address since I'm building this, the tertiary column of shales and sand 
various diagenetic processes and they come in, sorry, my finger, let me get back to that one. Come on. Oops. Oops, again. Sorry, let me get back to my slide. Okay. So various diagenetic processes are due to the increased rate of heating. It is just not the actual rise in the temperature, but just like a kerosene conversion, I'm defining something related to burial rate and the temperature, and also how long a piece of rock stays in that cooking window. So this is the rate of heating. And this increased rate of heating will release bound water in the pore system. And this is the bound crystalline water, for example, the bound water in the smectite that will begin to release and it cause, will cause further overpressure. Uh, on top of it, this will also call, cause mineral transformation that will affect the seal integrity. For example, smectite to elite is one, kaolinite to chloride, and, and the last phase is from elite to mica, for example. All of this elite and mica are not a good seal. Kerosene conversion to hydrocarbon, the buoyancy effect, is also a contributor to overpressure. So all of these mechanisms will provide the foundation for getting a physically reliable uh, pore pressure model. So here's get to the uh, spectacular elast transformation. This is very important, I realize, for, uh, for imaging, velocity modeling, and pore pressure modeling. Smectite is here, a 15 angstrom crystal is getting into a 10 angstrom crystal in a uh, clay platelets, and these uh, crystallized clay platelets are 270 plus angstrom. So the water that is bound in this smectizing of this water, they are releasing and these unit cells decrease from 15 angstrom to 10 angstrom. And this is a one cause of uh, overpressure. As this uh, uh, transformation happens, the, it leaves a signature on the X-ray diffraction data, which is shown on the right. This is the early pioneering work that John Howard did in 1976. And I, was fortunate enough to work with him briefly in 1981 when I was working for Shell. In this uh, diagram, what John was showing is this transformation to spectra to elite. In this case, 20% elite going towards 80% elite. This is happening in the random layering case. Random layering case means spectra and elites are random in this clay platelets. Then the ordering starts at right about uh, 90 degree Celsius. I'm losing my cursor, here it is. And this ordering starts and he called that the R1 ordering. R1 ordering means one elite layer is sandwiched between two smectite layer. Then there's R3 order, which means three elite layers are sandwiched between two smectite layer. This, he calls it a long range ordering. So this ordering leaves a fingerprint or extra diffraction but you have to look at less than five micron uh, extra diffraction data to look for it, not in the bulk extra chemistry. And uh, it also causes change in the anisotropy and that leads to my next slide. Okay, so this is the diagenesis of shales. I, I just described what that process is. I said clay platelets collapse 270 angstrom to 200 angstrom, bound water release ordering, rock intrinsic anisotropy. This is kind of important because this affects both velocity and density. And I will show you in a remarkable way. And I see the fingerprint of these velocity density transitions that I see with the burial history analysis that, provided, that is provided by basin history. It also causes fine grain silica to release causing cementation of adjacent sandstone. I'm not going to uh, uh, get into that today, but this is a very important uh, phenomenon. So this slide, I uh, took it from Anshuman. I added a few things. For example, this slide we are looking at 
how to model this complex phenomena of uh, spectacular transition, which is thermal history control. So I took here a geophysicist viewpoint, and then I augmented that by basic modeling. One of the thing at the top, which is called the compaction model, this compaction is now thermal history dependent. Athi type of compaction or many such compaction models in which time temperature history does not come into play uh, could be simulated from this by turning off the time dependent temperature history modeling. But of course we don't, because if we do that, we are going to lose the whole purpose of integration. So this compaction model is tied to this thing called epsilon or the void ratio, which is the ratio of the pore volume to the rock volume. So this compaction model sigma, which is effective stress, is related to this porosity or void ratio through this diagenetic function called beta. This beta function is defined in the next bullet through this chemical kinetics. It is a function of this integral in which A is the Arrhenius factor and E is the activation energy. And capital T as a function of little t is the time temperature history. So this gives me this function, eta, which is a part of this beta function. And I call that a chemical diagenesis function. I can give you more detail if you are interested in later. The third bullet here is that once you construct this compaction model and the diagenetic model, it affects the rock velocity. It gives you a rock velocity model, which is in the third bullet, which is expressed in terms of slowness in inverse of velocity, effective stress, uh, lithology factor X, and the diagenetic function, which is inverse beta minus one, which is a diagenetic function. So these are the key elements. And in the book, I talk a lot about how we came to do it in chapter six and chapter 14, but we can talk about it more if you are, if you are interested in. A shape of the diagenetic function is shown in the right hand side, thanks to Anshuman's work. He was a very bright, uh, he is actually, he's still bright, but he was my uh, teaching assistant when I taught the course. So he made a significant contribution uh, in linking this variant history modeling to the geophysical concept that I am talking about today. Thanks Anshuman. So in this, uh, uh, a transition, the onset is very critical. That's when the dominance of the mechanical compaction happen before that level we get in. And then somewhere around 10 to 20% of conversion, the diagenesis kicks in and it ends up with the elite at the end. The shape of this function is, is tied to the, the uh, sedimentation rate. And if the sedimentation rate is very high, the midpoint of the transition will be very deep. If it is just very slow, it will be shallower. And some of this uh, uh, in, in the, the um, references, you'll be finding some more details. Here is one thing that Anshuman did in terms of uh, using Petromart basin modeling. Uh, he generated this uh, porosity model on the left. This is from the eDragon data set that he's using in his PhD dissertation work with Tapan. Uh, on the right hand side, we have the pore that he created is the pore pressure model and smecta to elast transition volume is over here. And from there he creates a velocity model and then he added more value to it by quantifying uncertainties. So now I'm going back to velocity versus effective stress model. This is a key slide. You have this velocity on one scale, meters per second, you have effective stress in PSI. Now you have seen this kind of curve in rock physics handbook and many other literature that you have seen, but you usually see this velocity effective stress plot as a single variable. What I have shown here is a multitude of curve from this plots of beta, the diagenetic function, six in this case from six to 15, so the whole slew of curve. In fact, the beta function on the right is the continuously varying function. And so how this plot on the left 
we look like depends upon how deep the well goes. And I captured that transition using the actual data that you see on the left and the diagenetic function data on the right. So there's a little cartoon here, so let me press the button and I hope it works. So we're starting with the near surface here and uh, diagenetic function in this case near surface. Okay, it works, looks like. So as the well went to about uh, six kilometer, you can see the velocity effective stress function started with very uh, singly defined function, but it's slowly spreading out to a range of parameters between six, seven, and maybe even eight. Now, as you go deeper, you will see that this data does not continue this way, but it goes back. You see, this, this is what Bowers and many other people call stress unloading, that effective stress actually decreases. The stress at that, before I started the process was at 4,000 PSI. Now let us, at this point here, where my cursor is, is like a 1,500 PSI. So things are getting over pressure at this point. Uh, much higher. I can see uh, uh, the color codes, yeah. The uh, color codes, the depth, sorry, not the power pressure. It, 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 but next slide, I will show you what the power pressure is. So now, as, you, as the well goes deeper, I hit the button now. Now you can see the, the function, velocity function was here, and then it comes back again. So it has a little bit like a sigmoidal shape kind of function, which is what I think the diagenesis function is doing. And uh, this tells us that the velocity effective stress has a four dimensional space, although I'm showing here uh, through a velocity function in terms of this continuously varying parameter beta, but actually time and temperature both play a critical role. It's a, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional space. So here's the mechanical compaction. Here is the diagenesis. And uh, next slide is a transformation of that information into what I call a rock physics template. Rock physics templates has a two component. One is the velocity template, which is velocity here on the scale on the lower right as a function of depth and a density function, which is increasing density as a function of depth. Now, why do we want to create a velocity template or rock physics template? The first advantage is that I want to restrict the space, the physical space from the unphysical space so that when I do my seismic inversion, I don't get into this unphysical space here. So is this space, anything that is within this Template, I will call that a physical space. Okay, that is a very restrictive definition at this point, but that's what I'm going to use to constrain my inversion. <clears throat> this is a complicated slide, but I'm not going to spend too much time because this leads to <coughs> modeling. Excuse me again. Thank you. This leads to a workable model for seismic velocity model building. It's a complicated slide. Here is the legacy gather, one gather at a well location. And this is the well where we have the check shot data that is shown by this, uh, the square boxes. And I've identified a key horizon. There's two horizons here, this one and a green horizon. Then I have created a new model in which there's this black line that you see here on the middle slide that is labeled as velocity model, rock physics template. Velocity model is on top. And this corresponds to this new model of the gather, same as wiggles, but the gathers have been are modified now because you have got unphysical or non-physical pore pressure here. You can see at the bottom part, uh, the legacy velocity is outside, is below, pore pressure is below hydrostatic. Same problem is over here. Quite often this problem happens at a very shallow near the seabed as well. Since these velocities are lower, you can see these same targets are moved higher. 
And the gathers are still flat in both. So geophysicists use gather flatness as it is the main criteria. Point of this slide is that the flatness of gather is, is a necessary, but is not sufficient. Why is not sufficient? Because you can create a multiple velocity models which, which will flatten the gather with a consequently different image and different uh, pore pressure. Now, how do you do this uh, alternate new model? Okay, this is not just by eyeballing, but there is a parameter called the Thomson parameter called epsilon and delta, which I'm not going to get into it, but these parameters are adjusted by looking at the gathers at the very shallow depth where the hockey sticks come in and the delta parameter is related to that at the far offset. We start flattening those and then you create a, a, an isotropy model. In this case, there's a two layer an isotropy model for epsilon and delta that has flattened this gather. So we have technology now to do this thing, every gather of a given seismic section. Of, of course, it gives you a vertical velocity, for example, Oops. For example, this new velocity model that we have, this black line on this middle panel, this can be, this is actually better than the uh, standard NMO velocity because it has a physical basis now and it also flattens the, the gather and it also yields a realistic pressure. Now this can be applied at uh, trace by trace or in a volume. Uh, and this, this has been applied to your volume, software exists now. And I hope uh, in the Petrel, some of these softwares are there that if you are interested, you can capture it. So here I'm showing a good chunk of seismic data, I subsalt, I've taken the time out uh, and have labeled it 13 pounds per gallon, 14 pounds per gallon and 15 pounds per gallon. What I'm trying to do here is to flatten the gathers by using pore pressure as a criteria, which means I'm really choosing that velocity that gives me a particular pore pressure so that I can flatten the gather. It's just like a exit velocity flattening of gathers, but we do that in a pore pressure domain rather than velocity domain. So you, you can see, for example, uh, that at 13 pounds per gallon, I have some uh, reflections which are actually improved better in the 14 pounds per gallon flattening. The gather here, for example, uh, over there on the left side is much improved in the 14 pounds. But if you go to 15 pounds per gallon, the same uh, gathers are degraded. So the whole idea at this stage is to build a model in which we have a lower bound and an upper bound. I'm not suggesting we take a 13 pounds per gallon or 15 pounds per gallon. But once you have realized which model gives you a consistent pore pressure model and the flattening of the gathers everywhere, then you take that model as a starting velocity model for my seismic inversion. When we applied that for FWI uh, uh, inversion, full waveform inversion, he used the, the uh, hydrostatic pressure as one end and the fracture pressure as the other end to flatten its gathers. But there's various ways you can do it. So here is a consequence of this, uh, uh, poor, I call it a pore pressure analysis using new velocity model. It affects the velocity and bulk density of shale. These are the two important uh, attribute for, from the geophysicist viewpoint. And this data that I'm showing you is one of the deepest well in the Gulf of Mexico. It is published uh, and, and the references are in, in the back of the slide. Uh, it's a, this well was drilled in the deep water uh, up to 20,000 feet. What we see are several lines. Let me explain what those lines are. The line on the thin line here on the left side that you see is a smectite trend. The upper right thin solid line is the elite trend. And this magenta line is the basin modeling predicted pore pressure, uh, I mean, sorry, the basin modeling predicted density, density slowness trend. Slowness is the inverse of velocity from the basin modeling, which has gone through this uh, uh, part of the integration. 
And I'm showing this seismic data in terms of shallower depth to the deeper depth. The deeper depths are hot color and shallower depths are in a blue color. And you can see there is some systematic trend that seems to follow this magenta line, which is not a curve fit to the data. So let's look at that in a little more detail what's going on. So here I have got the same data uh, separated at depths below less than 6,000 feet on the right, 6,000 to 8,000 feet. And you can see on the data on the left, less than 6,000 feet, uh, so all the data lies on this smectite trend. The fluid pressure gradient for each are listed in the color from hydrostatic is in this case about 8.4 pounds per gallon to the fracture pressure which is about 17 pounds per gallon, 17 and a half. So you can see that the compaction goes on, these points are moving towards a higher velocity, which is natural, and the pore pressure is building up to closer to about 10 pounds per gallon. Same thing over here. Now let's go down a little bit deeper. This is between 8,000 and 10,000 feet. Now you can see the pore pressure is kicking up quite a bit. We are getting 12 pounds per gallon to something about 13 pounds. Over here now, 12 pounds to a 14 pounds range. And this excursion now is no longer along the smectite trend, but along the diagenetic trend that we have, that we have created from the model. The next one is 12 to 14,000. Oh, sorry. Oh, God. Oh, no. 12 to 14 and 14 to 16. And you can see 14 to 16 is distinctly getting much higher pore pressure. The last one in the sequence is 16 to 18, completely very high pressure now. Still, the velocities are increasing and the densities are increasing. And, and 18 to 20, almost at the end of the diagenetic trend. And if John Howard is a slide that I showed for chemical, uh, for the extra diffraction, it's right. And I'm sure he's right. Then you will have a micaceous phase to kick in. You will have a, another trend will begin there. We can capture all of that in the basin modeling. Here is a further example. I have got many examples, but I'm not going to go through that. This is the last one, in which uh, it's a shallow water Miocene well that Hui and Anshuman created. This is for the E-Dragon data set. <coughs> On the right is the right is the deep water data that I showed you. Now, in the E-Dragon data, you can see the well stopped at about, I don't know, 13, 14,000 feet. And the shale points are beginning to catch on uh, along this trend. What was surprising to me at that point is that I overlaid the, the geophysicist use a model called the Gardner, Gardner, Gregory to describe the density versus velocity trend. When I put that trend here, thanks to Hui and Anshuman, I was surprised that this really uh, is not capturing the, the, the transitions that I thought the Gardner, Gardner, Gregory will capture when they use the, the model based on the data that I had in a compacted high velocity rock, but actually it is not. Uh, I, I have to understand, I have to read that paper one, once more again. But this is the fallacy of the Gardner's, Gardner's model. I would have expected, uh, come on. I would have expected the Gardner model to go something along this line, but it didn't. Okay, so let me give you some example. These are the example and the references are given here. Some of them are published. Some of them are in the book. This one is published in 2015 in, in the Indonesian uh, Petroleum Assembly or some, some society, yeah. This example is from the Indonesia. Uh, in the Makassar Straits, east of Kutai, and the geographic location is over here. This is a thrusting uh, followed by synrift uh, and the synrift deposition environment. An exploratory well was drilled about two kilometer uh, depth uh, in the water depth. So here is the legacy model. 
from that area. And this legacy model of 2015 was extremely good model actually. If I take out all these circles and so on, you will be seeing that the gathers are flat everywhere. And this is a conventional anisotropic tomography followed by RTM, reverse time migration. Uh, this is a state of the art tool that was used. And this velocity model was created by that. We created a pore pressure model based on the velocity on the left. And I've highlighted many areas, what I call problematic velocities, or in this case, non-physical pressure. The circled areas are getting pinkish color. You cannot see the scale here. Pink color is below hydrostatic here, actually. This is a pore pressure scale. On the left slide is the velocity scale. This captures all the, the non-physical pressure. Over here, this one, this one, below the thrust fault, and the basement. The basement you can see is quite broken up. And if you use those velocities at those depths, you will get a below hydrostatic pore pressure. But it's not, not always in the basement. I have seen many cases, this is one example, where near seabed models, velocities are much higher. You can see there's a plinkish color, uh, maybe a thousand feet below seabed or so on, that, that has this uh, below hydrostatic pore pressure. And the reason for that is, again, if I put the legacy velocity model on the rock physics template, which is shown by this dashed line, uh, the velocity model in this legacy model is outside the hydrostatic limit. And the same thing happens right here. You see this tiny bit here that is outside the, uh, the template. That is the source of the non-physical pore pressure. So when you correct those, uh, this velocity model, go to the inversion and anisotropic model building that I described qualitatively in my previous slide, you end up with this new model. I call that a integrated workflow. This is still using anisotropic tomography and RTM, but, and the wiggles, the seismic wiggles are still the same, but the velocity model is different. And that gives you entirely different pore pressure on the right. Nothing is uh, below hydrostatic anymore. Nothing is above the fracture pressure anymore. Uh, and it creates a bit of a high pressure, higher pressure at the, at the well. The well was actually extended below thrust and the model was verified at that location. I cannot show the result because I didn't get the, permi uh, the permission when I published the work. This new model also impacts the image. Remember I, I said, I want to get a velocity model that gives me realistic pressure. Also, hopefully integrate, uh, improve the image. So here you see the legacy image for the same, uh, uh, same data set. And I, on the right, I saw this integrated workflow image and the highlighted areas show the improvements. You can see the better definition of this thrusting here, better definition of this uh, basement. You can see the basement has moved up actually because the velocities have been lower. Just to show you here, you can see the basement over at that depth left, it's, it's kind of uh, broken up uh, uh, structures. But when you go to this new velocity model, it's a much better uh, looking basement. Here it is. And of course, uh, here, the image, you can see this thrusting here has been quite well defined. And, and there's many areas, and if you look at carefully, you will find many more. So the point is that the image quality is, is also in, improved. If you make, create a model which is geologically plausible, and as I said, physically possible, that's what, and the physically possible criteria comes from the pore pressure. This is a second example, which is the last one I will give you before I conclude. This is well placement approach. Uh, this is from the high pressure, high temperature area. This is uh, 2016, it was published, is given in the reference list. This is the trajectory of the planned well. This is the seismic gathers. The, the 
uh, green is the planned, uh, the final trajectory, and uh, that is the final gather. And you can see the targets in the final integrated model have moved not only shallower, but also better focus. And you can see the targets are better defined as opposed to what it is. This target has moved here. And the shallow targets over here are much better. It has laterally shifted too. So the well was drilled up to here and then deviated up to here and then finished up to here. Okay, one point I wanted to make there, this is the rock physics template that was used just at the well location. And this is the power pressure model with the multiple regressions that was predicted from the model. And uh, this was verified, but I cannot describe, uh, uh, give you the pressure data. Anshuman took this kind of work and in his, uh, uh, maybe, maybe Tandi, you can invite Anshuman sometime to talk about his uncertainty estimation work. So this is one of his uh, slides that I took in which it shows the improvement in the prior, the, the basin modeling posterior and seismic posterior at two different depths. He has lots of work uh, done on the whole 2D section and he's publishing a paper in geophysics. The summary is that uh, integrated workflow seems to yield models that are closer to earth model. I said closer, a step, tiny close, not uh, uh, getting to where I think I need to go to. <coughs> Excuse me. Geophysical models benefit from basin modeling constraint. This is kind of obvious, I think, through the examples that I showed you. The geological transients, which are very important for seismic velocity model building, are captured because it does affect, as I show you, velocity uh, and the density of rocks in a very predictable way. So if you've got a well, and let us say, a Pliocene well, and if you want to know uh, how, what would be the, the, the attributes be if the well went to Miocene, you can use uh, this approach using basin modeling with the, with, the, with the new integrated workflow and you can predict what the density and velocities would be. So I tongue in cheek, I told once to somebody that I cannot recreate the seismic uh, traces in the paleo times like 30 years ago, because I was not there, <clears throat> but if I know the density and velocities of the well at 30 million years ago, then I can create a synthetic seismic uh, 30 million years ago, and that would be my uh, geophysical tool, but that is just tongue in cheek. The, this approach yields results in uh, realistic results in velocities and better pore pressure. I'm calling that a pore pressure imaging rather than pore pressure prediction, because everything is an image when you use seismic data. <clears throat> Non-physical pore pressures are not encountered in the workflow because these are constrained workflow now. And the seismic gather flattening are carried out directly in the pore pressure domain. And that's kind of important because you're building a pore pressure model as you build your velocity model simultaneously. This process yields acceptable range of velocities and densities for inversion. And inversion, at least what I saw in Hui's dissertation work when I was working with him, uh, the number of iterations that he had to took at actually has, has decreased in, in many cases. And the last but not the least is the, whether a fault is sealing or non-sealing can be evaluated uh, through approaches or approaches similar to that. So where do we stand now? So we have, Access, and this is something that uh, uh, Allegra wanted me to add. Thanks to her guidance, I think I captured some of the things that he wanted me to talk about, she wanted me to talk about. One of them is that the Wissam's PhD dissertation, which Tapan was a big part of it in the basin modeling, he included thermal transients on rock physics template with diagenesis, and he applied that to the Thunder Horse data and got some very good results. Who is PhD dissertation, as I said, was done with uh, Biondo. I was advising him along with uh, many others, Tapan. And the SAP 2019, he published a full report of it. And he included the integration of diagenesis, velocity modeling, and anisotropic full wave inversion for imaging. 
but he didn't complete the whole loop. Neither did I. Anshuman's PhD dissertation is nearly complete with Tapan. Uh, he's approached the, the issues of integrating basin modeling, pore pressure and rock physics modeling, and he added a very valuable piece called the uncertainty quantification, which will affect uh, some of the future work, I think, because I have not captured that myself. The future work may include, will include, is being included as per Allegra on Joshua's PhD work in Viking Graven data. He just got the data, I think recently, from Ackers BP. And where I hope you will have the time to complete this integration loop. So I, I put this question mark here uh, and, uh, and I hope uh, that happens. That's the end of it, folks. This is the references. You can read that one uh, on your leisure. And this is the end of the talk.